We're about to start at six o'clock, so a few more minutes. Uh, we're going to start as planned. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh.
Sveiki visi. Hello. Sveiki visi. Hello. I'm going to speak in English because we have some guests from, from other countries who came to this meetup. So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Audrius and thanks for coming. Um, we were expecting quite a lot of you and it's really nice to see all of you here. So, I'm just going to do a short intro and then let you get on with the sp speeches. We're going to have a few great speakers. So first of all, I just want to ask you, just to understand who's here, who of you codes or at work or on their free time? Who, who's a developer? Raise your hands. So uh, quite, a few, quite a few developers, I guess. Who has um, played with AI or a TensorFlow or things like that before? So I guess quite a few of you will be a little bit new to, to the subject. Um, but worry not, <laughs> the talk should be understandable. And if not, you can, always, you can always go and talk to the presenters and ask them how, how to start in this field. So just, I just want to give you a little bit more info about, so, so about ourselves and who we are and why we do this. So as I said, my name is Audrius. I'm a CTO at Baltic Institute of Advanced Technology and the founder of Arisi Labs. Uh, what we do there is we have this community of scientists who work on different kinds of projects together. And we just thought it would be great to start a community movement around the AI. We wanted to create something that would be that would be something that could be contributed a little bit and a little bit by everyone. So we started this group and really hope we really hope we could then expand this um, up to other countries and not only keep it inside of Lithuania. So whoever of you has any ideas about like contributing, doing stuff with AI, please come to us. We're, we don't want to run this by ourselves. We want to gather this community, make it as big as possible, and keep running these events, and try to do them every month, really. So that's going to be our goal for the next half year. We'll see how many AI startups pop up in Lithuania to fulfill that demand. But hopefully after tonight, there's going to be quite a few. So what are the goals? We, we sat down and we thought what would be great is to just to gather the whole AI community together, then deliver presentations about projects that people have done so others can get inspired, can see what problems they came up with, you know, what solutions for those problems they came up with. And also we wanted to do a little bit of paper reviews. Gediminas here used to run that meetup at Neurotechnology. Um, and currently, we're going to sort of transfer it over here and then hopefully do some more technical research paper reviews um, in, in other meetups and discuss newest topics in artificial intelligence, deep neural networks, and, and et cetera. And we also just want to sort of get the message across to the general public about promo promoting AI, promoting positive sides of things. You know, we kind of want to have a world where, you know, AI is understood as, a, as, as for what it really is, rather than being, you know, afraid of. So I think, you know, these sort of events, and hopefully people who come here who haven't experienced AI before can understand this isn't as esoteric or as scary as media sometimes make it sound. And uh, that's a sort of a personal goal. I think Lithuania should become AI first country. As Google said, they want to be AI first company. I think we have a duty to, to be successful worldwide, and I think we should do this. I mean, we have a lot of great minds and scientists and people who have enough academic knowledge that they can step into this field rather quickly. So I think we should really, really push this forward. And with the current events and all these new startups popping up, I think we're, we're doing that. So we'll just keep the momentum going, and uh, hopefully we'll get there. Um, so for today, the program is such that we're going to have two talks then the pizzas are going to come, <laughs> we're going to have some snacks, and then uh, two more talks. So please stay till the end. At the end, um, I, have a, I have an announcement about the next meetup and, and, and a few quiz questions. And uh, the first participant is going to be uh, Gindras, who can come over here. So he'll introduce himself, but uh, we worked with him together on this silly app that uses AI, and then he can listen all about it. And um, the other, so the second talk is going to be more about uh, more serious stuff with AI, about detecting, uh, you know, cancers and uh, winning competitions. Then it's pizza time, as you can see by that pizza emoji I looked for all day long. And then we're going to have Token Mill talking about language, how do you work with words, and then we're going to have Exacaster, 
and they're going to talk about large data sets and what they do with them. So without further ado, I'm going to let you just plug in. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Gunteras, and we made this app during AI hackathon with Odris. It's called Hipster Match, and yeah, I'm going to talk about how we approached this, how we made it, how we got into the field of AI in the first place. Yeah, but first, a little bit of introduction of what AI is. So you hear all the time artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and are they different, different things? Are they the same thing? So artificial intelligence is pretty much the broadest. You can call pretty much anything artificial intelligence from simple algorithm that just is hard coded and plays chess. Uh, then machine learning is a subset of that and it in actually incorporates learning. For example, uh, it has some pre-written algorithms, but sorting your email, you get a lot of email and it can uh, do, as the time goes, it can decide which email is worthless or worth your time. And deep learning is a pretty new area and uh, the term has been coined in 2000, I think year 2000 and only in 2009 it began exploding because of hardware um, improvements. And this deep learning pretty much means uh, neural networks with, with deep uh, hidden layers with huge neural networks pretty much in, in simple words. Yeah, so deep learning success. Uh, a little bit about, about why deep learning is such a hot topic right now. It's because NVIDIA introduced GPU powered uh, model trainings and there's, uh, there are masses of accessible data now, nowadays. And I really like this quote, deep learning may look like alchemy today, but we eventually will learn to practice it like chemistry. So it's still a very new topic, but it's getting more and more accessible and yeah, as we see, it's, it's pretty widespread right now. So how, how a simple neural network works, uh, how it defines if it decides if it's a cat or a dog. So we have an image, we provide this image in, in a specific format for our model, then it does something that we don't know about in, in the middle and it produces answer. It's either a cat or a dog. Yeah, so enough theory. Let's go to how we got <laughs> to how we got into AI field ourselves. So, so it's basically magic, right? <laughs> yeah, basically the middle part is magic. We know the first part, we know the end part, and this is something. <laughs> yeah. So at first, Odris. Uh, said that there's AI cam going on, it's, uh, it's gonna be a huge topic and we need to have yeah. a good idea. Just, and just, just a, little, a little bit for the background for those who haven't participated. So, so the AI camp is this great event, it's like a conference about AI. It's a conference and it was a hackathon together and it was organized by Thomas, um, one of the people getting involved with AI a lot and uh, we just by chance decided to go there again to us. So it's a great event and it's gonna, it's gonna happen next year I hope. Yeah, so we started thinking about how to get into a artificial intelligence field because it sounds like it's a difficult and uh, secretive field. So we wanted to have a, the simplest idea possible. Also, we, we come from mobile background, so we wanted this idea to be on, on mobile. And Odrus had this amazing hipster or squatting slav idea, Sim simple enough, just as I've shown in the example before just 
do you see a hipster or squatting slap yeah, on your phone? Yeah, actually, eventually it was just do you see a hipster, but we realized it's, it's not easy to classify one thing. And, you know, Ginthras is an iOS developer, and I barely code anymore. So we, we, we wanted to pick the lowest common denominator. But this is a good example of how you can get into this field, even, even if you don't know much about it prior, prior to doing it. Yeah, and we had heard a lot about TensorFlow, that it's also hyped technology. So essentially, it's an open source library that helps you train models, test models with, with the data. And there are a lot of pre-made models that you can just take and try to use out of the box. So, and with this idea, we went into the hackathon and started setting up TensorFlow, which took like half a day maybe for us, just setting up according to very clearly written tutorials. Yeah, so, and setting up iOS according again to tutorials and this proved to be the hardest thing about getting started in AI for us. We also tried Android, but it didn't go as well. It was slow, so yeah, we pretty much dropped it eventually. And we chose Inception v3 model. Uh, so it's a pre-made model that is used for recognizing images. You can train it to, to recognize your desired images of different categories, for example, cats, dogs, monkeys, fish. And when I say you can train it, what I actually mean is you can manipulate this last part of it because everything else is already pre-made. It has a lot of hidden layers, magic, magic inside. <laughs> and so I think, I think this is a good example of that. Even today, today it's easier to get into this field compared to what it was two years ago, because there are big companies like Google making these tools that you can start playing with, and then, of course, later you can go deep down and write this thing yourself, but currently you have this model that's been trained with 1.2 million images, I think, to detect edges, and now we can just use a couple thousand to, to do the rest. Yeah, before 2010, it would have taken years and years to, to do something, to prepare a model like this. Yeah, and now we can just use it in, in five minutes, if you know how to do it. And yeah, so we trained our model with Hipster and Squatting Slav. It was, it was a success very fast. We were quite amazed how fast we succeeded. And also, we found out that it, it synthesizes sound. Hipster. Yeah, so it even tells you that you're a hipster. It not only shows you that. Squatting Slav. So you can see a demonstration. Complete hipster and complete squatting slav. Yeah, so in the first day or so, we already achieved what we wanted. So we tried to take it furthermore a bit with multi more categories. Um, yeah, so we chose uh, some distinctive categories like gangster, banker, stoner, and we just grabbed randomly 500 images from internet. And there are some crappy images for, for our purposes on the internet. So then we wanted to figure out a way to clear this data up. And we made another app for this, Tinder it's, it's sort. basically, yeah, Tinder for, Tinder for cleaning up your uh, image data. Yeah, I don't remember exactly which way you need to swipe to like it or, or hate it. And it's connected to server, and multiple people can just swipe pictures if you think it's a gangster and stuff and we use this data on for for training our model we found that was the quickest way to clear 1000 images pulled off from google and um, we made this little uh, mechanism so if several people did it you would have uh, you know assign a confidence score to it so you could have multiple people do it and then you have a pretty good data set yeah so as you can see it's two sorts per second pretty quick um, so, after sorting our data, training our model with 3,000 images, it takes from two to five minutes to train, to train our model with, with five categories, with 8,000 steps training program, whatever that is, and it, the app works fluently offline. It, uh, as long as your device has enough memory to, to expand all the model, it, which is pretty big in, in memory consumption. It works uh, with 60 frames per second with video streaming. 
So yeah, the model itself was about 120 megabytes, but when you unzipped it into iPhone's memory, it was 700. <laughs> so we had to load it into a heap differently so the iOS wouldn't keep killing the app, but. Yeah, and we had some downsides on our way. Celebrity, apparently celebrity filter isn't very distinctive enough. Also, when f the first time we trained our five categories and we were happily placing our phones face down on, on the table and it, the screen turned black, it started saying gangster, gangster, <laughs> because all, well, gangster pictures are dark and so you have black to be aware. pictures and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, you have to be aware of these things <laughs> before deploying your apps. Yeah, then again, data sets are crucial. For, for example, with Duckface, uh, it's mostly images of women, so our app classified pretty much all women as duck faces eventually, so it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, and we tried experimenting with vegetables to just because, why not, just random thing, but we tried to train it with assortive vegetables, not, not specific carrot, so it doesn't work with too many things in one place. And, and we were hoping that it would say, it would be a vegan category, so if you got classified as a vegetable, that would be like... <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. you know, you have to understand this is this is all sort of a joke, and we're just playing with this technology that's really quite accessible these days. And any of you can, if, even if two mobile developers can play with it, I think a lot of you devs out there can pick it up right now. Yeah, so we did all this these experiments within two days. Of course, real world, e even though model says it's trained uh, with precision of uh, around 90%, real world is a bit different. So. Yeah, it's for entertainment purposes mostly, and now you'll see a demo that we built in by the end of Hackathon. Banker. Banker. So it detects a Banker. pattern. Banker. Which we trained for. Squatting slab. <laughs> Hipster. 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 Hipster, hipster, gangster, 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 hipster, 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 hipster. You have to really mean it. Stoner, stoner, hipster, squatting slab, squatting slab, squatting slab, squatting slab. Squatting slash. Adequate piece of music with the, with the imagery. Hipster. Hipster. Stoner. 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 Gangster. Oh, bitch, get out the way. Get out the way, bitch, get out the way. Oh, bitch, get out the way. Get out. Gangster. Anchor. Banker. Banker. Banker, banker, gangster, and then we tried. gangster. And then we tried some local politicians. I mean, we, you know, this is all AI. Stoner. I was gonna clean my room until I got high. I was gonna get up and find the broom, but then I got high. And Hipster. I think we got all the results out the first time, so AI thinks it's on its own. Gangster. Squatting slab. Oh, 
Um, yeah, but I think, you know, entertainment, the part, the point is that it's really quite easy to start playing the technology and everyone should. That's it. Yeah, so Hackathon ended with, on this note. So as Oder said, it's really easy to start and for entertainment pur purposes, it's perfect. It's a new sa uh, sandbox for, for crazy ideas, whatever you can think. You can use images, sounds, texts, and uh, there are pre-made materials for, with models that analyze different things and tutorials, how to, how to do something like uh, those uh, picture filters, AI based. Yeah, and it's a future-proof technology as we see the trends. So after AI camp was over, we wanted to move forward with, with our Hipsterify app and to release it in the upcoming two weeks, couple of weeks, something like that. Now, yeah, it's been three months and we did release it, but, but not in a, but we're still planning those two weeks. Uh, so after AI camp, we rebuilt everything from scratch, removed some functionality because we didn't have license to play those sounds, and we checked everything to, to well, have licenses covered. A uh, couple of redesigns because, again, we didn't have rights to use those icons, maybe some, some images. Uh, played around with retraining, but we didn't achieve anything more spectacular than we had in the, in the beginning. And we added some new functionality, like face recognition, so that uh, you cannot spot a random tree and it, it wouldn't say hipster. It would at least, well, try to recognize a human being before, before trying to identify what uh, type he is. Um, yeah, so what's next for HipsterFi? At first, it was HipsterFi. This is version from AI Cam Hackathon. Then we rebranded it to HipsterMuch and designed logo ourselves and designed everything ourselves. Now we have a professional designer uh, who designed, well, rebranded again, Swag Meter. And yeah, it's professional designer's icon and screens. Yeah, so a bit nicer, cleaner. That's the future of, of HipsterFi, hopefully soon. And I think that's it, what, what I want to share with you today. So before I introduce the next guest, uh, who I wanna, I, by the way, bring your computer so we can connect it while I talk. Yeah. So the next guests are pretty interesting because they actually use AI. As a team, they have won four Kaggle competitions. For those who don't know what Kaggle is, who knows what Kaggle is, by the way? Okay, a lot of people. For those who don't know, it's uh, now Google platform where companies can host competitions to solve certain AI problems for, for money. And then people can apply and try to solve them. So for example, you know, there are various problems starting from, from what Dyrus is gonna talk about to, to you know, various other images. Let you talk about it, so here you go. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lyrus. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. So uh, the presentation is all about how, you, how a programmer could and, and become an AI expert, like so the path that uh, I took myself and I quite succeeded. So uh, I hope that my presentation will be quite uh, useful and uh, I hope you enjoy it. So yeah, so uh, uh, I have a few questions to ask first. So how many of you have heard uh, uh, about a guy named Andrew Ng? Okay, so quite a lot. So 
how many of you have uh, completed his machine learning course? course? Okay, so more than expected. Yeah, so and another crazy, crazy question, how many of you uh, like uh, Eurovision contests? <laughs> okay, <laughs> three people. So, okay, so the thing is that Kaggle uh, started from Eurovision contest. So they host, hosted their first competition as a predict uh, who will win uh, Eurovision like, like <laughs> seven years ago. So it, it was their start. Uh, and they become quite successful. Uh, m many people joined them, and many competitions followed. So currently, there are about uh, a million users, if I'm not mistaken, and like uh, over 50,000 active users who are really uh, trying to compete and, and learn some skills. So yeah, so I think basketball is quite a hot topic today. So I picked this uh, this kind of problem. So as a data scientist, you have to solve like problems which are, you are given or you think of yourself. So let's say we have a problem and we want to predict uh, an outcome of uh, basketball matches. Uh, we, we have uh, an expected result what we would like to achieve. Let's, let's like beat the odds and then like make money in the gambling market. And uh, yeah, so let's say we have some data about, uh, about like two teams competing like one with a basketball icon uh, and, uh, and a team X. So this like a very, very simplified uh, uh, version how a model works. So let, let's say that the basketball team uh, uh, has a star player, let's say name, uh, named Z. So like the one connection leading to the star player. So those uh, two teams uh, itself have uh, two common things like, like uh, let's say 3.4 is like an average uh, uh, difference of scores like teams which uh, uh, average uh, winning point rate like uh, for for those teams so like uh, let's say that the winning basketball team uh, usually scores th three more points than uh, team X uh, so another point like would be like uh, previous matches like those teams have played uh, earlier and the basketball team won before and let's say another non important feature uh, let's Okay, so it's not kind of important. So yeah, so when you bring these features together, uh, you have a model and you have this an output. Uh, you can predict the output of a uh, next uh, basketball match. So yeah, so this is pretty much how uh, modeling works. You have a problem, you have data, uh, you try to define the problem in a mathematical way, and and you try to apply your skills uh, uh, to solve the problem uh, the most uh, in the most efficient way. So, okay, so this example uh, is not uh, <laughs> out of the blue. Uh, this kind of competitions happen in Kaggle. So there's like this N uh, NCAA basketball tournament where student uh, basketball teams are competing uh, with each other in, in a tournament. And you like to, to have a, a task to predict uh, the, all the possible outcomes of all possible basketball matches between each team. So uh, you make a, a predictive model. Uh, uh, and other people are also trying to, to achieve the same. So your model, which you're, you're going to make, will be scored against uh, other people who are solving the same task, and you quite can actually compare yourself as a, a mod modeling expert. Where do you stand? Are your skills good enough to, to, uh, to solve this problem? Uh, and so on. So in, in the end, of course, like winners get their prizes uh, and, and rewards, uh, and, and et cetera. So this is my profile. Uh, I actually just wanted to show you that I actually started Kaggling two years ago. So it was like quite a short time to build a, a good Kaggle profile. So like on the left, you can see the overall rank, ranking uh, uh, in, the, in the community, which solved the problems. Like, so if you could imagine like you have a, an, uh, an ATP rating in, in tennis, so it's kind of a similar thing in data science. So, so at one point I was uh, ranked fifth. So there is another uh, rankings like uh, kernels and the discussions, uh, which, which it seems like you're much better at talking there. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to talk. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's easier to 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 to, to get a uh, ranking in talking than actually making models. <laughs> yeah, so this is me. Um, so I, I would like just to give a short 
list of potential problems that people are solving. So we have like a regression task. So uh, we would like to predict how much money uh, per, a, a person will spend in a shopping trip or, or how much money will spend in a casino or, or whatever. Then we have a classification task. So that's like we have a photo. Is it a, a cat or a dog? Let, let the model say where is a cat or which is a cat and which is a dog. Uh, segmentation, it's like a problem when, let's say, we have a plane which flies over the, the, the continent and makes a f aerial photos of, of buildings, uh, streets, uh, forests, and so on. And the, you want to like outline which, which part of the photo is building, uh, a, for, uh, a tree, a, for, a forest, or, or so on. Then there's another task, uh, recommendation task. So it's quite an important problem for people who would like to Put uh, advertisements to correct people to, the, to, to correct people to the audience, which is most likely to click the ad. Let's say. Um, then we have time series. It's quite a, a big problem, like solving uh, uh, stock market movements and, 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 and similar things which happen in time. And uh, lastly, we have optimi optimization problems. So let, let's say. We have a, a delivery company which has like m many personnel who delivers uh, many packages, and a company wants to optimize the route so it could cost uh, could cut could cut uh, the costs and and uh, and to uh, optimize their profit rates. So yeah, it's like also a very important uh, task. So this is my personal view. Uh, there are uh, actually two competition types: machine learning tasks where you work with log files, data tables, those like banking information, uh, like, like phone transactions and, 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 and et cetera. So, uh, and the, another is like deep learning tasks. It's like neural networks for sensoric data, images, uh, sound, videos, everything that you can like uh, feel, see, or, or hear. Uh, my personal view is like this artificial intelligence bus, like like a term, is like is more associated with uh, deep learning more than machine learning, uh, because deep learning kind of is like the thing that people immediately see that uh, okay that you can uh, identify something in a photo, so it's easier to to, under, to to present this thing to to ordinary people. But in, in the end, both, both of these learning types, types, let's say, solve the same mathematical problems. So yeah, so if you are good at machine learning, you're probably going to be good at uh, deep learning and uh, vice versa. So what kind of tools uh, are common in, in, in an AI field? So uh, uh, I picked uh, this histogram from a very popular uh, data science uh, blog called KD Nuggets, where people who actually build models are asked uh, questions which language they use. So you can see that um, there is a, a trend of, of uh, Python becoming a very uh, important language to learn. So in the past, R was very um, uh, very widely used language. Now Python is like a thing to, 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 to follow. Um, so if you're going to work with like traditional data, like log files, data tables, uh, R is also a good pick because it is very good at it. But if you're going to, to if you feel like your career would uh, be, if you would like your career to end up in deep learning, you would definitely pick Python. So yeah, so Kaggle, uh, from my experience, is like 80 to 90% people are using Python. Uh, this is the graph from uh, Stack Overflow, uh, which shows uh, uh, how many, how, how question distribution is, uh, how questions are distributed by the programming language uh, people are asking questions. So uh, we can see a clear trend. Uh, I don't know if you see, but the red line is a Python curve. Uh, all other languages like C, Sharp, uh, PHP, C++, like are almost constant. So yeah, so trend is obvious. Uh, if you're, if you feel, if, if you if you think that there are more alternatives, uh, I think there aren't. <laughs> Just pick Python and uh, go on with it. Uh, okay, this is what I, I think. 
So how to actually get started in data science field? Um, I think Agile is very, very good uh, start because it has uh, over a thousand data sets. Uh, you can uh, actually pick a, a one uh, which you would like uh, to work with. So let's say there is a data set of, of uh, IMDb uh, ranked movies, uh, uh, soccer matches, uh, credit fraud, uh, Pokemons. Uh, okay. They're very, very different and various kind of data. So you just open the list of data sets and you pick the one which interests you the most and try to solve the problem which is presented to you. Uh, and on top of that, there are 250 competition data sets, uh, which are also very, uh, very useful to, to go through. So Kaggle itself is very user friendly for, for a newcomer like, like uh, you or me. So there, are, there is an environment where you can, you can code and run the, the, the code online and uh, get uh, immediate results of, of your, uh, let's say, model. Uh, People uh, uh, are rewarded for sharing uh, their code. Like people, uh, if you write a good code, there's a high chance that people will upvote you, and and uh, this is like a <laughs> karma points for the for the profile presentation I, I showed you. So if you write, make a good code, many people upvote you, so you can like earn those ranking points in, in kernels. Um, uh, then there is uh, notebooks. So many people uh, uh, are. Uh, uh, well, many people just like to to make a story what they they see from the data, so they like they uh, get the data and try to to make a story for you to to read and understand what are the key aspects uh, on this data set and how, how uh, what prob what uh, methods could be used to approach the problem. Uh, again, this there is an environment for that. You can write your own not notebooks. And uh, of course, a very important part is uh, discussions. So there is very friendly community uh, of, uh, as I said, a, a million uh, people who are interested in data science. And yeah, that, again, if you're contributing to the forums and your your ideas are like very unique or very contributing to the discussion, you also get rewarded and get those uh, discussion ranking points. So yeah, so the, this is the, the things that you can do in Kaggle. Uh, uh, I actually went, uh, went through all this phase like uh, in two or three months before I actually started uh, showing good results. So I think if you have a, a dedication to, to, to learn something, I think two or three months is quite a, a uh, reasonable time to get the basics of uh, machine learning, uh, its application, uh, and so on. So yeah, so, uh, and the second part of my presentation, I would just like to, to, to say what our c company is doing. Uh, so we are focusing on deep learning. Um, we are trying to, to, to learn something uh, from images, uh, mostly medical data. So uh, I'll just skip through for the, the basics, how everything is, uh, works. So let's say we have a collection of cars, uh, trucks, uh, bicycles. We have this so-called magic, which was presented before, and yet we get uh, the, the, the outcome of, uh, uh, of our model. So this is quite a hard uh, slide, but uh, I would like just to, to say the, the concepts of how actually deep learning works. So let's say you have a, a, a photo of a, a car. Um, uh, then using this uh, photo, we want to create uh, features uh, that our network could uh, uh, learn with. So deep learning essentially is like um, building a layer of uh, information uh, which is associated with a photo, uh, given the different uh, resolution, uh, aggregation and, and, and such. And I, I don't know if it's, it's very hard to, to not make it technical. I, I think I'll just skip to this slide. So okay, we have a, a, a car, let's say. So in the first network uh, layer, we are learning the basic concepts of, uh, of shape. So let's say like lines, uh, different angles of a line, and, and so on. And uh, on the, so we, we learn small details of, of the photo. Uh, 
in the deeper levels, levels we're learning, learning the concept, which could consist uh, a car, so like a, a wheel, a, a rear window, or, 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 or a blinker. And in the end, we get a generalization of all this information. So we know that we have a, a car on the left, and we know that by these features, this car is very similar to the previous, pre previous cars that that um, model has learned. So it just can say a confident prediction that this is a, a car and a nothing else. Yeah. So if you get this concept, it is quite uh, easy to understand. So the, uh, the previous presenter talked about uh, a TensorFlow, which is really a very popular uh, framework for making deep learning models. So I just wanted to, to, to show you that it is very easy to, to create the model in a code. So uh, I, uh, on the right side of the slide, you can see all the code that is necessary to let's build, build this, uh, to like define the model structure that, that the model is going to learn. So it's like uh, 30 lines, uh, very easy to understand if you uh, get the, the concept of all the information that is in the model. Uh, okay, so let's make some <laughs> images, <laughs> photos. Okay, uh, I took these uh, photos from a Kaggle competition called uh, Dogs versus Cats. So uh, there, there was given like 10,000 photos of uh, cats and 10,000 photos of uh, uh, dogs. Uh, very small, uh, smaller res resolution, like 64 pixels uh, and yeah, so one, one uh, person ran a script, uh, shared with a community, and uh, showed his, this result. So, okay, so like a first photo is quite confident that there is, it is a dog. Uh, second photo is, okay, it's, it says it's a cat, but it's like 54% sure it's a cat. Uh, the third photo, okay, it's even hard for a human to say whether it's a cat or a dog. Probably it's a cat, but the model says it's a dog. So yeah, so there there are some uh, uh, model ma models make mistakes, uh, and uh, getting uh, more data about uh, some certain uh, labels uh, helps to learn uh, with smaller error rates. Okay, there with images there are like four main uh, tasks. So with a single object, we have a classification task, which uh, I talked about earlier. Then there is a localization problem, like to show where the cat is. Then uh, there is some multiple object that problems, like to detect many objects in a photo and to, to classify them that it's a dog, a cat, or a dog, uh, a duck. And, uh, and also very important uh, task, image segmentation, just to mark where the, 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 the dog is or, or a cat is. Yeah, so this is the principle of uh, how detection works uh, in, in neural networks. So on the left side, uh, the detection algorithm tries to make some random guesses of, of coordinates of possible objects. So let's say we have 300 random boxes with uh, random coordinates, and for each random box, uh, a model tries to, to, to classify whether it's in a uh, uh, onion, uh, whether it's uh, pepper or, 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 or so. So this is the main concept of detection, <laughs> create uh, bounding boxes and classify uh, the information which is in, in those boxes. Uh, the main disadvantage of, of such approach is that, uh, as you can see in the photo, um, a model does not recognize Heinz ketchup. <laughs> Well, the thing is why, he, why the model did not recognize the ketchup because the model was not built to detect uh, the ketchup. <laughs> so yeah, it's quite uh, uh, quite to, to make a model which could predict many, many types of different objects. And I think the largest one is like an image net competition where there are like a thousand uh, uh, different uh, objects a, a model can learn. Now there's a few more slides like how actually uh, a model works. I look at this very, very, very old uh, photo of uh, 
like 90s uh, computers. Uh, it manages to, to classify mo all the monitors as TVs. Um, then there's a, piece, a person sitting on a bench, uh, and so. So again, there is a, a, a thing uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, a building, uh, for example, a, bu a building in a second photo is not recognized. Well, because the model was not meant to do that. Uh, other photos. So this is basically how detection works. Uh, uh, and you can actually make uh, an app, like a, the Hipsterify app, uh, with, which did the, the, basically the same thing that, that is shown on these photos. Uh, okay, this is face, face detection. Uh, it seems like detecting a face is quite a, a simple problem. Uh, okay. So about detection models, there are, I think, four main uh, frameworks which you can work with. There's like a faster RCNN, yellow, SSD, like those, those fancy phrases. But there is just, uh, every, every framework has its uh, niche. niche. Uh, niche, right? So uh, you are just making a trade-off between accuracy and the speed. So with the single shot, shot detection framework, we can actually make uh, a stream of video detecting things. And the good thing is, uh, no. <laughs> uh, well, this this is just a name of a method. There, the history was that there was a RCNN, then a, a guys thought about how to make it faster, then, then came fast RCN, RCNN, then after a few, uh, few months they thought of even faster algorithm and they just called it faster RCNN. So those, those, here, those four methods are like, like mainstream today. And uh, the good thing is that you can easily uh, uh, get the, the necessary materials in, in, in GitHub. It's just not a commercial thing. Uh, AI is all about uh, uh, openness and, and, and developing the cool methods we can see today. Yeah, so what, uh, what about us? So we actually are a team of seven. Of seven. Uh, th three of us, uh, okay, four of us uh, actually competed in Kaggle competitions. And we, th we saw that we have an opportunity to, to apply our skills and knowledge in a deep learning field, like to make something great here in, in Lithuania. And uh, we ho really hoped to achieve that. And in the meantime, we really hope to, to build a, an AI community, a, a place to learn, a, a place to do research uh, on, a, on some task which you find interesting. So, in the long term, uh, I hope uh, that we are going to make a good country to learn AI and be quite famous uh, worldwide. Yeah. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> I don't know how many of you like anime, but uh, this is uh, another area of deep neural networks. So the, the girl uh, in the slide is like, completely generated with deep neural networks, and you can actually tune the parameters and generate your own uh, anime avatar. So it's can you print it on a giant pillow and sleep? <laughs> uh, I think resolution is quite low, but yeah, it's, 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 it's very funny thing that, that you can synthesize the data uh, learned by deep, uh, deep learning. So I actually recently knew the fact that the uh, gaming industry is uh, all, also started using this kind of deep learning synthesizing technology in, 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 in games like generate uh, textures for, for, for trees uh, or, or, or so. So yeah, so in the end deep learning will also change the, the gaming industry, industry as well. Great. Okay, so this is my presentation. I hope it was not too boring. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> who are 
trying to learn machine learning. He has this online course, Coursera. Uh, it can take like two or three weeks to, 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 to get into the field quite uh, quickly and get the concepts of how, how it works and why it works. So if you're going, to, if you haven't started and think of, okay, uh, 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 this uh, data science field is like interesting for me, so you definitely want to try Andrew NG course. Yeah. Next. <laughs> The previous presentation. Can you repeat the question because there's a recording? No, so, so the question was Andrew and G course was for a guy found it quite difficult to understand because of the mathematical, loss of mathematics, yeah. Uh, personally, uh, I haven't took Andrew and G course myself because <laughs> Because uh, at the time I learned it, uh, I, I understood that I already know everything he has to say. But, uh, <laughs> but I think the previous presentation has shown that the mathematical background is not that much important. Uh, I think that it is quite easier to get into machine learning or deep learning if you have solid uh, programming skills. So if you have that, uh, it's not a big step to learn something, how to, what to make from data. And if, if I can just add, if you want something that's a bit lighter in mathematics and a little bit more applied, I suggest watching Siraj. There's this guy on YouTube, and he makes great videos explaining these concepts. They're a little bit um, you know, less in depth, but, but it's definitely a good start. So it's, it's a good, if you type in deep neural networks on YouTube or just Siraj, that's, that's a really good place to start too, I think. Yeah, more questions? <laughs> so, oh, okay. Well, so the question was, would neuroscience, background in neuroscience help? I, uh, I think it, in deep learning context, context uh, I think it would. Uh, I am not familiar with neuroscience, so. <laughs> But I think it would. So is there any other questions? You can always chat. Guys yeah, so uh, I'll be available throughout the evening. Yeah. Please free to, to come and ask. Um. So now it's a very short sort of grab pizza time. <laughs> so you can go there. There's some hot pizzas that are getting cold. Grab a slice, get some drinks, and refresh yourselves. And get, let's get back here at around 10 past 7. So next presentation is past seven in 15 minutes.
visus perėsnematymus sustatyti savo outputą į greit vienas ar ne? Ne, 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 ne,
Ahem. Ahem. Uh, the session is about to start again, so grab less pieces of pizza and uh, come back if you want to hear more stuff about AI. Uh, let your colleagues know at the back that the session is about to start. So, um, th those at the back, uh, if, if you could uh, come back and join us for the session, that would be great. You can bring the pizza boxes with you. pretty old really and and we we in Lithuania have people who've been working in it for quite a while and I think Zygimantis is one of them so it's quite nice <laughs> to have him here and uh, give him a round of applause and let's see what he has to say Watch this. Okay. hello oh hello so as it was said uh, my name is Zygimantis and I will be presenting slightly, probably slightly different angle on artificial intelligence. It's not about recognizing cats or hipsters or crunching like numbers and producing a tag. It's in a way different process. You get few, <laughs> few data points and you want to generate a story. So basically it's like, you know, the other way around, starting small and then exploding in, in any direction in storytelling. Um, right, so uh, some say that a picture is worth a thousand words, but is it really? Like if I have a chart, do I have to like analyze it and look at it and think about it? Okay, what does that mean? Ah, okay, sales are increasing at certain months this and that, and if I am familiar with the domain, it's okay. But if I receive, like, I don't know, my pension fund, fund, whatever, which I look at, don't know how often, and I have to look into those charts and try to understand it, I will understand it, of course, eventually. But if there is a sentence, you are doing well. The sales are best in winter, but are dropping in summer. That's one sentence where I'm much better understanding sentences, text, than uh, images. Well, in some cases, charts and text probably the best. Or take this, uh, what's that? Uh, a microwave, but if I want to buy it, I might look at it as much as I want, but it will not tell me anything about, about it. I want to know to get a, if I am uh, male connected to you know, e-commerce sites, I should get a first sentence saying, yeah, it has a cool defrost function, you will be on time to your work. If there is a family connected, they say, okay, defrost function will not uh, destroy your 
vegetables from. <laughs> right, so I think, well, the point is that text is really important. Making, you know, being able to understand certain data points and generating very good explanatory text, depending on the context, has a lot of applications. Um, so here comes natural language generation, and it's old field, as all the AI is old field. It's, you know, 20, 30 years in, in progress. Uh, mainly two areas in text generation. One is something I was already talking about. You have data and you want to generate human language narrative, so describing charts or whatnot. The ever recently very popular area is, uh, so this is called, yeah, data to text. This uh, linguistic generation is uh, linguistic descriptions of text. And this one is conversational interfaces or as commonly known, chatbots. So, okay, this is all, you know, a lot of products you can open, you know, with AI, API and look at it. So again, I will be focusing on, on uh, data to text. Here are also like derivative areas like video to text or text to text like summarization and, uh, and so on. So again, really broad area in, in natural language generation. Uh, some of the examples probably weather generation. So if you have like numbers for temperature, wind speed uh, and so on and so on, you generate description of text. Well, it might look like, you know, it's trivial and it's not necessary to do that, but imagine you are not in Lithuania, or, but you, you want to generate weather reports for all the ports in the United States or European Union. Then you have to generate minute differences based on the boat type, uh, cargo type and whatnot, different text for, for, for each port or, you know, for all the farmers who want to, you know, get like speedy reports about, you know, danger for, for crops. Sports like uh, going in, you know, basketball statistics, okay, who is passing the ball to who, and out of that you want to generate, on the fifth minute, you know, this great basketball player passed this amazing ball and we, may, we won, something like that. Um, okay, now a bit more complex things. Uh, so why it is, it is uh, difficult to do natural language generation? It has multiple modules, multiple components, which are basically disconnected and have to deal, you know, from first, like your data science, understanding which bits of data are important. So if I have a uh, stock market or whatnot, uh, a stream of data, or I don't know, heart condition, or my uh, wind turbines in, 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 I don't know, generation plans. All of that I have to you know, decide which data points are important to communicate. Then I have to plan in which sequence I will be telling the, the message. So first I have to tell like really important things, then maybe I have to convince, and then maybe I have to provide some of the examples. Once I kind of have this conceptual map of the text I want to generate, then I have to go into you know, each message, how I will, how I will you know, uh, express my weather temperature, my, do I use numbers, do I use, uh, do I use uh, words, and so on. So basically, you have, you, know, you have to plan your document. You have to do micro-planning at the sentence level, so you know, how, how, how facts are arranged in, in, in text. And then down to realization, choosing actual words like, you know, really formal words or more like hipster words and so on. So again, a lot of problems which, which are fields of AI in their own terms. So like, again, trying to determine which content we, we have to use. So that was the, basically the field described previously in the, in the previous uh, talk. Um, how do I uh, choose, you know, which words to use? That's again, you know, digging through a lot of uh, text, machine learning, uh, determining, okay, which data points have um, kind of a, the biggest efficiency in, in expressing, expressing my ideas. Um, 
then okay having that you also have to plan your your discourse so you know it, again when we talk it seems like we are you know we are constantly improvising but it's not really the case it's the, our language is always really structured first we are preparing introducing certain concepts then we're providing certain background elaboration giving a contrast and so on so all of this is discourse theory or rhetorical structure theory based on that certain structures linguistic structures expression expression structures are working best for you know for sales another ones for for uh, describing your finance and again choosing which discourse structure is the best for which domain again another ai problem how to match those two two areas so you have to segment your customer base for example and then decide okay what which which discourse you know has the best effect or in in that area um yeah so those two um you know multiple multiple components in language generation and also kind of trying to model the discourse forms i'd say the package of any any nlg solution and again you you will have like different different ai techniques to to go with so all that brings us to you know this ill defined problem of ill defined problem in a way and on top of that it is complex so it's not that i have very precise uh, understanding very precise kind of model what i want to say at the end okay I, i want to express weather in certain locality but how it will be expressed it's not really defined when i'm starting working on it so that's why it's kind of an ill defined problem on top of that we have so those kind of stages in in in, in an lg generation i have i have decided which concepts i want to express i have to then uh, build you know semantic level of of my messages plan the document in in this column and so on so you can do this sequentially and when we work with that we mainly do this in in sequence so each step but there are like uh, also ai techniques like blackboard systems or boyesian probabilistic networks what not which i totally unfamiliar with if someone will you know in the audience has any 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 knowledge of how to make a system which allows to different agents to collaborate sharing the data because you know when i'm planning the structure of a document it looks like i don't have to look into which words i will be using but that's not the case if I, if my document is a short message then the, and and then that means that my words has to be have to be strong to uh, have to be very short so if i'm planning the document at this stage i have to know my semantic structures so it's all you know mixing and matching and then in all sorts of, of unpredictable ways um i hope it's more or less clear <laughs> okay uh yeah so so what is the difficulty with machine learning or deep learning as well in this approach so as i mentioned in the beginning that in this case the space of what we generate is basically infinite the amount of linguistic utterances we can produce is boundless so instead of you know giving a training set with the features and then the label we cannot do that because you know output is really big so how to do that and uh, people are trying to do that so but even the training data this is a sample from one of the open source products so uh, projects which which are trying to to train restaurant descriptions so even in the just one item of training data is really complicated because you have to go through abstract data your concepts which you are dealing with so it's restaurants locations this is as an input to your training data then that is binding to full data which says okay which are concrete rest which concrete restaurants and which locations are in that space then i have to bind it to kind of possible realization of a sentence so it's all you know really gets into really really deep waters of of trying to to use uh, traditional machine learning um in a way it can be looked at as a, also as a machine translation problem so you have like data points and then you have to so that's one language and then you have to translate it into you know different language human language that's also one of the approaches how to, how you might do that 
Um, yeah, so I'm not telling that, you know, machine learning is impossible or deep learning is impossible in the best area. It's just that, you know, the problems are slightly different than, than trying to categorize or, or something like that. Now, um, one of the things we're using with NLG is this, you know, artificial intelligence planning. And planning is really old, you know, area of AI. They use it for satellite navigation, rockets, robots, basically. If I, if I have a task like in this green box of current world state, so I'm standing here and I want to go to, you know, to grab a pizza, that's a diff different state of the world. I have to pass through, through this all possible states in the world. So it's a graph travels, traversal problem. So, you know, I want to go here, A, B, C from, from that. So in the, in the natural language, language generation, it's also similar. So that I have a state of all the, of, of my kind of communication goals, what I have to say. I have my data points, and then I have to traverse all, go, go through all those you know, different knowledge graphs, and find best, you know, best paths to the highest score. For example, how are we scoring it? Is that for if again in this example with a microwave? So if, if there is a certain customer profile, I will weight certain certain things higher, like you know, speed of uh, heating up food or something like that. So the path which allows me to communi communicate the message, certain message will, will get you know higher higher score. And there is a, then the space for again for AI, AI the, the machine learning approach where I, and again I can train those paths saying okay which one is kind of has the best the best effect. Um, yes. So, and again, this is just one of the one of the one of the components in in the whole pipeline we were discussing. I was I was having in the previous slide. So, um, with this, for that's that's a sample from one of the our applications. So, I have a kind of a, a house with a lot of uh, properties. So, bathrooms, floors, what kind of floors I have bedrooms and so on and so on. All of that is specified in the databases and now I want to generate something like that, perfect for the big family. So instead of a number which says 100 square meters, it will generate a sentence like, like, like that. But this is also telling me, okay, which of the properties, this, the whole that machinery of, of choosing what to say has decided to realize. So for some reasons or input reasons, certain data was not was not chosen to be realized. So what we what we have on that side, it's also kind of the additional model input model into into the AI algorithm, which says, okay, if my tech my text has to be not too long, that means I have to drop certain attributes, and based on on weights. Which uh, which attributes are not important? They will not, you know, come. Uh, they will not come into into this uh, final text. So, and again, the choices, you know, here are going from choosing attributes to which words are we implementing. You know, instead, of, like if there is a, if the user connected to this system is is not a family, then you know it's the perfect uh, house for uh, big house for family will not be generated because that user segment is not like interested in 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 this uh, in this message. Um, yeah. So questions. That's what that means. So, so the question is, just to repeat for the recording, is how do you transfer these things from one language mm -hmm. to another? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we have all that machinery here. So the last row is basically language, independ uh, language dependent. The upper rows are language, so, you know, content determination. It's, you know, it will work in Chinese as well. The numbers are the same. Uh, then, uh, well, then this level is, uh, is semi -language. Language independent because it, the structures of language has still to be the same more or less like, you know, 
This will work for, for like English, Lithuanian, but probably will not work for Estonian and Hungarian because we have some kind of crazy Finnish, yeah, uh, different structures of, of language. So, but this, when, we, when, you have, when you basically start realizing sentence itself, choosing synonyms, you know, expressions, and so on and so on, then it's, it's, it's of course, it's, it's language dependent. But again, this, this picture is more complex. So, uh, so this is like, you know, those different stages, like document planning and sentence structures uh, selections. So as I say, though some of, they, they are all interdependent. So to, so to a certain extent, the language, the words I'm choosing will also influence the document planning. For example, Lithuanian words are longer. And I have a constraint that my document should never be longer than uh, 1,000 characters. So of course that's, that will all, again will slightly change. So there is a barrier, but let's say top thing is is, is less dependent, and the bottom thing is row is, is more dependent on the language. I saw there were some other questions. Uh, somebody raised their hand. No, no more questions. Then I have a. Oh, here we go. So, can you repeat the question? So, okay, the connection to planning, because in planning we have the states in the world, like your, all of your positions now, and uh, like we want to all of you to get you know to get the pizza. So, like a second stage. So, action is to announce you know you have to go or something like that. So, just simplifying a lot. So, and in here we don't. We, we, it's different. It's of course we don't have like objects in the world. Yeah. So we have we have our communication goals so and the communications goals are like I want to communicate the price for the for the thing I, or I don't want to communicate the price because it's too expensive or I want to say that the floor in that house has you know in the bathrooms has tiles because that's very important ex really good property of the house so those are the states now the actions are like okay I will want to say like elaborate that's an action. Elaborate on the on the composition of the floor. That's one action. If that's not enough, then I will probably go into examples of that thing. Another action, like as in this famous celebrity has also those uh, that kind of floors in her house. So those are kind of you know those rhetorical messages. Those are like actions, uh, which help me to go through the states of realizing each attribute in, in, my, in my description. Attribute is like a thing I'm, I'm describing. In this case, in this case, we are building kind of a high-level template, and also having all sorts of dictionaries, which we can. Our background is in NLP, in natural language processing. So once, we'll, for example, the client would come and want to collect all the color descriptions of dresses, we can have a different NLP system, which will go in and extract all the color descriptions. In this case, which I showed, it's a simple, simple application that we have where we manually list, list the uh, things. But yeah, ideally, in, in a proper full solution, you have, and that's, yeah, and that's another you know, kind of mind-blowing thing with the NLG, that it's, it's opening yet into another world of NLP where you have to ingest the data. So, so again, if we go here, so... It's, that, that's kind of the input, with the, of only the data of the heart rate, let's say. But there is another input as well, like doctor reports, where we say, okay, how we describe this spike here? How we exactly describe that? And, well, if there is, if there is no you know, budget in the, for that, we just manually do that, or you can <laughs> create a system which automatically <laughs> reads that as well. 
Any more questions? So the question was, which tools are you using to describe a model? Uh, right. So it's basically all all custom custom builds. Starting. Okay, we were using Lisp, not Python. That's really cool. <laughs> uh, but again, since since the whole thing is so, it's not fitting so well into into kind of standard the, the deep learning model. We basically are forced to, to do to do our own stuff. Yeah. But it's closure, not Lisp, right? Yeah, yeah well, I thought Lisp uh, will be more be <laughs> broader known than closure, but okay, closure is a Lisp, so <laughs> modern Lisp, let's say, like that. There's one more question there. Can you give some quick examples of your clients? Like, what kind of services you have provided? Okay, so, yeah, so we are an NLP company. So the, the question was the clients and the services and yeah. what sort of things do you do? Yeah, so we are an LP company. We, we are main, mainly focusing on understanding the text. So we are ingesting a lot of text and then turning it into the graphs. Now we kind of get bored with that and we are moving to NLG, to generating text. And that's our first step at, at this, at this, at this product with the, the description of goods for e-commerce. We don't have like no clients yet for that, but hopefully soon. Uh, yeah, but NLP is, uh, for NLP, our clients like media intelligence, financial companies which want to know, track, track certain things about, about, you know, prices or something. Great. Let's give a round of applause. So I, I asked our next speaker, how, how should I introduce him? <laughs> and he said, his company does this thing. If you go to the Rimi shopping center and you click on the till machine to do something and they recommend you stuff. Not only that, they work with a lot of mobile operators, uh, helping them to decide whenever the mobile operator has to call you to try you not to leave the company. So, so I think uh, he'll introduce himself better and let's, uh, let's hear from him. Uh, I'm wondering how much of you guys at least have heard this name, Exocaster? Okay, quite a lot, nice. So, today I will be talking about one of our research and development projects. So, uh, every couple of years we do some crazy research and development, and this is like our uh, ne next thing which we are working on uh, a area. So at our company now we have like, I think 25 or so data analysts and data scientists. All of them are really crazy busy. And the thing is like, if we would have uh, another 25 or 100 of analysts and data, uh, data scientists, they would still be all crazy busy because uh, this is such a huge amount of work that needs to be done. and. Uh, we just need really smart guys and really intelligent guys. So we decided to try to solve this uh, challenge as we like to automate everything. So um, we decided to take a challenge to start automating uh, the analytics. So now the common thing is like a CEO or marketing guy or, or salesperson, whatever, goes to BI analysts, asks some questions like, how was my sales today? And then guys go and do some reporting and bring the chart. So what we want to do is we want to basically kill the BI analysts part and do it uh, totally automatically. And uh, 
at this point of time, we know that this is kind of really doable and we are starting like experimenting with first part of this robotic analysis part. And actually, uh, we didn't plan that, but uh, uh, Token Mill guy, guys were actually talking about this part. They were showing some charts and how to des describe text out of those charts. So our next goal will be to write a bot to whom you just write, say, okay, how was my sales, uh, what can you tell about the sales today? And then we get, uh, bring them back the test, uh, text and the analysis uh, fully automated. So uh, it, this is a huge project. It will take us roughly two to three years to finish this up. Uh, so we decided to start from a very, very simple use case. So, and the use case looks like uh, monitoring in time series data. So once you start thinking of, about time series, you can draw a simple chart and then some outliers, yes? And the monitoring for us internally in the company is really, really important. Because we have like, I don't know, three, four thousand different data sources which are coming every day, so we have to make sure that ETL is processed properly. Uh, we have, uh, we are aggregating, I don't know, in total probably 50 or 40,000 different metrics, so we need to make sure that all the data which we are actually processing is correct, etc. So we need to pro, uh, monitor the data quality on a really high, uh, high standards. So when we started working with this project, so we went on the board, we draw this really nice chart, and we said, to find those outliers, it's like a piece of cake, nothing to do, and uh, uh, basically we will solve it in like one week from now. Then, um, what we, uh, what we decided to do next is we decided to go and take one of our customers' product sales, and they have like uh, 150,000 different items on stock, and we uh, physically draw 10,000 charts just to understand whether the charts are really beautiful. And uh, these are just a few examples of uh, really regular product sales. So what we understood suddenly is that um, uh, outlier detection or change de detection problem is not so trivial. And uh, here we started to work uh, with a bit more challenges. So um, at this point of time, we have uh, come up with a five-step solution to define the outliers and changes, and we have uh, uh, five really simple steps. So we get a time series data. First of all, we have to understand, is this time series uh, worth looking at all? So is it a straight line? Is it a total random, or is it something else? In the next step, so once we clean all the random things that are not interesting at all, in the next step what we try to do is we try to look at the chart and try to interpret as a person would do. Uh, then, when, once we get some high level understanding about the chart, so for example, does the chart has uh, periodic uh, values? Does the uh, chart is uh, increasing, decreasing, etc.? cetera? Does it, uh, is it stable at all? Uh, then we filter out all unnecessary charts and go to the next level to do some uh, period uh, and seasonality analysis, and then we can finally fi um, just uh, find the outliers. So, again, detecting uh, random data in chart is uh, the first step. And I will be presenting one really, really easy solution how to understand whether your time series is random or not. There are like thousands of ways how to do randomness tests. Uh, here I'm just presenting one which is like uh, the most easiest one you can basically build with your uh, uh, two lines of uh, Python code. So, first of all, is it a random chart or not? Is the data there random or, or not? How do you think? Not at all, yeah? And this is one of the product sales. Could you um, guess what, uh, what is the product in the regular retail store? Beer? Uh, no. 
No. Uh, this is actually magazine Ramones, uh, the sales uh, <laughs> on a daily basis. So you can see a clear pattern that on the day when the magazine is actually uh, shipped to the store, it actually hits the peak and then drops. So a really uh, easy technique to understand whether this data is actually random or not is just taking two points uh, of the time, like t minus 1 and t minus 2, and put those points into scatter plot. If you put those points into scatter plot, you should find some patterns. So in this case, we see there's a really actual pattern where like nothing and really high, and then very close values. So uh, if we see this kind of pattern, uh, if we have this kind of pattern, we can do a next step. Jo uh, just draw some, uh, uh, some lines and basically put them into the squares. And uh, if the data is random, all the squares will get pretty much uh, the same amount of points. And if you average this out, it will be the best indicator uh, that you have random data. And it takes you like two lines of code. Zero math yet. Uh, another thing, another chart is like this. So this chart looks way more random, yeah? And if we do the same trick, so we see that this is, uh, we have the points all over the chart and it's really easy to determine that this is uh, just uh, random noise and we should skip this chart through, uh, from our analysis. So very simple thing, yeah. Then the next thing is high level data description. So, Imagine you are starting to analyze your data. So basically data usually comes in CSV files. You open the Excel and they are like ton of numbers. You would probably never look at those numbers directly, yeah? So first thing what you do is you make a chart from those numbers and do the interpretation in the chart, yes? Easy money uh, until that point. Our question was, should we analyze time series as a time series problem? Maybe we can analyze this as a vision problem because our interpretation as human is not looking at those numbers like this is like 22, 25, 20 something. No, I look at this chart and I see there is some stable time, then we have a jump, like a, a step function here, st a step up, step down, and stable again, yes? This is how I interpret the chart as a human. Maybe I can do the same with uh, deep learning because basically if we are able to uh, make a time series challenge to a vision challenge and uh, basically vision I treat like as a solved problem, uh, I can do magic things here. I can start interpreting data like a human without, uh, with a breeze, I would say, yes? So this was exactly the first thing what we did in our R&D. So what we have done, we generated like tens of different of uh, uh, time series functions. And uh, we built some deep learning uh, algorithm he here. It's like, um, we use like multiple convolutional layers and then we use the multiple uh, recurring neural network layers and basically we, predict, uh, we, we teach the deep learning neural network to interpret uh, the information which is in time series in a human way so that we could say, we give a time series chart and, here's you, uh, and here you go a description of what you have in that data. So this is like a kind of really simplistic scenario. So just to give you one example, how does it work? So here we have a time series data, and here we have some labels which algorithm tries to assign to the, this time series. So what is happening? So for example, we have a label which is flat and this is green, yes? And we have a flat point here. So the probability that this point is flat is like one. So we, get, we know that. Until this point, the data is pretty much flat. 
Then we have like two additional labels, increasing and step up function, yes? So we see, okay, this is kind of increasing and also we have a step up there and uh, we can add, we basically add tens of different labels there. So what we get is we, we basically get an interpretation out of the box about the chart. And uh, so what we did next, so let's, uh, so we thought, okay, uh, we can interpret some of the data easily. Maybe we can play with that data. So for example, if I am starting to draw an image, I will get some description. So let's see if the video works here or not. So uh, we did a really, really basic uh, thing and uh, we, uh, we just developed some tool to browse, uh, to draw something with a finger and uh, to see how this algorithm will basically uh, extract the core features of the chart. So you see, uh, like it recognizes that some data is stable, uh, that some data is decreasing, etc. So this is like the thing which we st started playing around. Now what this thing gives us is like it gives us a totally new dimension on analytics. So if you are an analyst and people come to you and say, hey, uh, can you bring me the, a report about uh, product X sales, yes? And you go and write a query, uh, select uh, product X, group by, by date, and some sales. It's totally boring. What we can do now is like say, give me the sales, who, uh, give me products whose sales look like this. And you draw with, with your finger. And suddenly you get all of your uh, items which have this exact behavior. You can do the same with, uh, let's say, I don't know, if you are monitoring the servers, uh, uh, ETLs, etc., Or uh, you can draw with the finger, let's say, drop, give me all the sales which just dropped or who's, uh, which are increasing really a lot, etc. So you can start doing magic with this really, really, really simple thing. So we worked with it uh, a bit and then we started moving further because what we can extract with this type of thing is like, uh, we can say uh, this time series is periodic. So it means like it has like some stable patterns. If we know that it has some stable patterns, we can then do some uh, uh, per uh, period detections, et cetera, et cetera. And we can filter out all an interesting time series from our analysis because the biggest uh, challenge in um, outlier detection in general is false positives. Because if you, if you use standard uh, outlier detection techniques on the time series which you do, do not know, you will get lots of false positives, which means that they are saying that there is an outlier in the chart, but actually there aren't one. And you will be getting like thousands and thousands of uh, time series uh, which are not useful to know. So, after we did all the magic, filtering out the, all the random data, we took information, up, uh, we took high level information about the chart. Now we can go and do some outlier and change the detection, which again, you can do in a very, very difficult way, or you can do it in a simple way. So in our case, as we already worked a lot with the data and we already understand almost everything about the chart, our solution for outlier detection is such simple that you again can implement it in two lines of Python code. So in our case, uh, really simple things work. So what we do is we take a sliding window of the time series, calculate uh, quartiles, so 25th and 75th quartiles. And uh, we have this sigma, which is like 75th quartile minus 25th. We have some spread there. If the current value is bigger than three times uh, sigma, we have an outlier. So, and this is an example. Easy money, nothing to do here. And uh, when you analyze time series, interesting information, it's not only outliers, it's actually also change 
uh, change in the time series behavior. And change is uh, a way different function than outlier. So imagine we have a time series over there, yes? And the change is actually in the step function. So in each case when you have a step up or down, a behavior of time series changed. And it might not be an outlier, but it is a very important piece of information because if you were processing some uh, table, you used to process some table in two hours, now it takes six hours. It will be uh, a change, yes? And you want to know that. And to, to find a change actually, again, there's really, really easy thing. It's uh, bias and change detection, which basically uh, fi uh, tries to find the multiple changes in your time series doing a very sim simple thing. They analyze uh, averages and uh, variance in your time series and tries to find a point at which the probability that the uh, means and variance changed in the time series. So at the end of, of the day, what you get is uh, this little chart shows you the probability that at a certain point of time, time series changed. So we can combine now outlier detection and change detection and start giving some interesting information for the monitoring purpose, yes? So here's one chart and uh, we, we marked a uh, green part uh, where we detect a, a change and the red one where we detect outlier. It's by far not perfect yet, but we are uh, like uh, moving further on. So in this case, as you see, the time series is, is pretty stable and it slightly changed its behavior and it immediately got marked as, uh, as a change. And here and here we have outliers and they are uh, actually um, marked as outliers. Now imagine that we can do this for 150,000 products, uh, for like f uh, 500 different servers, whatever, whatever, automatically uh, every time without any analysts intervention, uh, intervention and we still get a really awesome results. So this is another example how we are actually detecting the changes and the outliers and, and here it's like a really, really minor change and probably would not uh, want to report it every time uh, because it will generate false positives, etc. Here is another much nicer example and all the charts are actually real sales data. So this is some product sales uh, aggregated on a daily basis. So, and we have a clear sales change here and a clear sales change here, though there are no outliers actually. So, and um, yeah, to finalize, uh, we are actually uh, finishing this part of our project uh, now and we will be opening an API uh, for you guys just to start working with your time series if you want. And we will be probably exposing most of the information that we have on time series. So, and if you want to try, you can write me an email and I will let you know once the API is available. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yes, we tried it multiple times. <laughs> no, so the, the, the architecture like uh, uh, CNN plus RNN is the thing that we had to go with because uh, CNNs didn't uh, work or we didn't have uh, 10 years of experience to build them, to make them perfect. But uh, at this point of time, the architecture of CNNs plus RNNs, uh, this is the way to go for us. Um, so the question is how much yeah. manual training does it need? So uh, I will allow you to guess. 
and and any any guesses exactly because we can generate the training data by ourselves so uh, i will go a few steps back no sorry so this is yeah so the only training data we need is this and we can generate it so we don't need to label something manually it's uh, it's the beauty of the process. So, so, outlier formula is here, actually here. Uh, that, that, that's why we have this part which says periodic information detected, periodic detec detected. I know the period. If I know that the data is periodic, I will detect the period and will remove it from outlier detection. So this is, uh, again, very simple thing to, to solve when you can prepare your own training data. There you go. Um, so the question is, it, since you're generating data yourself, is there an overfitting problem? So uh, uh, yes and no. The thing is like, you see, this is a straight line and it has a ton of randomness. So if you prepare the data by yourself, you have to be smart. So you put in as many different randomness as you can figure out. You add uh, periodicity in your, let's say, decreasing chart. You add uh, huge spikes, etc. You can play with that. It's like uh, it's your world. You can create the world how you want. It's like you, so if you know that you will overfit something, generate more random, randomness, and that's it. But the thing is that you, the core label you have. So you know that, that, the, that the function looks like this, yes? And now you, def uh, you define 100 different variations of this function with lots of randomness, uh, no randomness at all, and that's it. Here you go. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask something that is not related to data that much. Um, as you can see, I'm not Lithuanian. I'm actually from China. And uh, I moved to Lithuania around three months ago. And I'm looking for a job in this field because this is also my field. And uh, I want to ask you in general, what is the climate of the job market here in Lithuania? Do you have a large needs of data scientists or not? Or we already have a lot of ta talent in this country. And I also want to know about your personal experience. Do you hire? a lot of non-European Union citizens like me. And, and you can give me an example in your own company like Xcaster and how's the diversity in your company and so on. Thanks. So, uh, okay. So uh, the general climate in Lithuania is awesome <laughs> to start with. <laughs> Everything is really fine. Data scientists are really, uh, let's say, uh, superstars now, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, actually, one guy from China should come to Lithuania to Exacaster uh, to, to start working with us. Uh, we have another girl from Canada, and um, we work all over the world. We almost don't work in Lithuania, so uh, we are very diverse. I just came from Colombia and El Salvador. so. And, uh, but this is probably not only Exacaster, all companies in Vilnius, especially from high tech, so they are awesome, so. Do, do you think there is enough of a supply internally? So because uh, uh, we just grew like from, this year we grew from like 12, 13 analysts to 25 now, and uh, uh, we are still struggling quite a lot. Uh, to find people who would have really the right skills uh, and the right mindset, but um, 
So the approach is you take the people that you can get best of them and train them. So it's like if we don't have them, let's grow them. And the guys here are actually adding up a lot. Okay, thanks. But uh, I, sorry, I also have to mention like um, from my personal experience, so I want to share a few data with you. And uh, I've been relocated to Lithuania around three months ago, and I applied around 20 or 23 companies here in Lithuania. And uh, 20 of them either respond with rejection or not respond at all. Three of them gave me an interview, but eventually they rejected me also. And uh, unfortunately, Xcaster was among one of the com company who didn't respond to any of my application at all. Yes. I applied job through your online portal, and after m one month, I didn't get any response. And then I also sent an email to cv at xcaster.lt. And I'll, of course, as you can imagine, if no response uh, at all. If you need so, some help with the CV, you can send it to me. I'll <laughs> help you out, man. So sometimes yeah. I was imagine like, is that like, am I so unqualified? Because I have a PhD in mathematics from uh, one of the best universities in Italy. I graduate from Polytechnic de Milano, and uh, machine learning is one of my speciality and the research interests as well. And I had other experience in studying in other countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, United States, China, and Slovenia. So, so I think. This is really a question like it, com it confused me a lot. I don't know what I should do in this country. So, uh, I, I, mean, I can I'm answer uh, this question too, actually. Um, uh, and this is nothing related to you. Um, at this point of time, we are so busy with the work with, with, that we, uh, there's a really good chance that I will miss CV, I will miss my client's email. I will miss my colleague's email. I will miss my, I don't know, wife's email. It's because that the amount of email is crazy. So it's like, um, um, it's, it's nothing to do with the people. It's just the timing is so crazy that um, things happen. And I would so. say never take no for the answer. Just keep applying. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, I have. Uh, is it on? I have more technical question. How do you deal with a different scale in, uh, in, in data structures? For example, if you have like uh, some variation or like sinusoid in small scale and you have like bigger feature, how, how you extract both of them if they are important? So, um, yeah, we had a lot of discussions internally how to do that. Uh, in the very beginning, we um, used to scale everything down. Um, but then um, we wanted to get closer to um, how person would uh, analyze the data. So, uh, you know, with Excel, it's, uh, it's like scaling, uh, well, in general, when you analyze the chart, scaling uh, might be like a lying to yourself in your face. So if you have, let's say, a scale which, uh, which is like 100,000 sales, yes? And uh, the variance there is every 100, like 100,000 uh, and the 100, 900, uh, like 99,900, etc. You, when you have, uh, like, if you look from very top, it will be a flat line. If you will zoom, it will be a huge changes. Yes. So uh, there's no hard, let's say, math behind it. But if I am as a per if I as a person would analyze this data, it would be a straight line for me. So we take the same approach there. Yeah. Yep. Uh, then this product will appear to the market. So uh, this is like a more moonshot for us. So uh, we, we hope to finish it in the next two years. But the API we hope to have uh, in a month or so from now. So API for beta testing and start using just raw data there. Uh, we, are ve we are basically very close. But the goal is much bigger than, than giving an API. Yes. Okay, one more question here. So how many 
data analysts are you going to fire? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I hope all of them. <laughs> No, I'm, jo I'm just joking. It's like, uh, uh, it, it's not ab about firing people. It's uh, uh, making them work with more interesting problems. Uh, this is like the key thing. Um, if, you, if, you, if you are bored with doing reports, then go think about the business. And uh, so, yeah. Any more questions? Here you go. Am I correct? You have uh, images on that yes. site, you put them in the images, and then you get uh, from uh, deep learning the yes. data. So my question, from what I see, I look that you are like normalizing and, and under some scale, doing normalization of data. And so the question is, why do you need the images, the recognition of images? You can just normalize the data on some specific scale and just use the data for classification, why is it images? Um, so it's really related to the hipsters, you know? It's way more fun <laughs> to analyze images than just analyzing uh, the, the raw numbers. It's like there's no charm in it, you know? <laughs> and, and, the, and again, the human does, does that, you know? Uh, I do not go and don't look at the, like, this is like 1.5. No, I, I am looking at the chart and I see this is declining. And that, that's, that's what I need. So that's why I am looking at image, image and, uh, and actually working with the, with, the, with, the, with the image, not with a list of numbers. This, this reminds me of integrating by cutting the shape out and weighting it on the scales. This is yeah. sort of <laughs> like it achieves the same result, but it's way more fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and it's much more fun, <laughs> by far. So we had so much fun just uh, inventing this uh, architecture because it, 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 it was just like a real R and D project. It's like what it's what's actually in our heart. So. Any other questions? Good. Let's give a round of applause to our speaker. And just before we finish, I have a few words. Um, so we had a really great lineup of speakers. The head of the event is going to represent Now, now, now you have to be quick. So, tell us what this is. Shout out. Paper, by any chance? Okay, nobody knows the author. Who knows the name of the paper? Who knows what it's doing? Do, do you know what, it, what this? Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. It's a very interesting paper, and I suggest you guys read it. It's basically um, the, those guys at the top, with the glasses are classified as people at the bottom because they're um, using well, the, the adversarial attack with, with the actual paper cutouts. So as a, as a, as a prize for the correct answer, is uh, some T-shirt for you. And uh, <laughs> I'll add the links to the description, and you all can check it out. Um, and now I just want to talk briefly about the next meetup. So who thinks we should do this every month? Okay, every two months? Okay, let's do it every month then. Um, that, that was always the case anyway. Um, so we have, we have a list of speakers for the next event, and I'm not gonna reveal them. I'm not, not gonna spoil the names, but I just wanna, I want you guys to read this. This is basically who they are. And for what's coming, so we're gonna have somebody uh, who looks at the traffic a lot. We're, we're going to have somebody who knows a, a lot about AI and pigeons, especially. And then we're going to have somebody who trusts AI to make him money. 
Hopefully they'll talk more about that. <laughs> and then we have somebody who will let AI to play and make games. So we'll we'll have more announcements about uh, what's coming next time and where, where it's going to be hosted. It's most likely going to be here in, in AI Lithuania group. So I suggest you guys join that. One of the guys from here just created it a few, few days ago. And I think we can just keep in contact there. Uh, since I got your details, since you had all to go, all had to go through this iPad thing. I'm gonna <laughs> invite you anyways, but uh, yeah, just let's stay in touch. And um, we want you to join. We want you to join and speak, talk about your projects. Um, you know, sponsor the pizzas. If there wasn't enough, then <laughs> you can chip in for more pizzas next time. And we want you to build a community and be part of it. So if anyone has any ideas about how they would like to change this or join and talk in the event or organize it differently, just drop me a line on Facebook. Talking about emails, everybody misses them. I'm Audrey Zeus on Facebook. Just, just, just message me there. And thank you all.